Thank you very much, Will. I'm uh, very glad to be here this morning. I uh, have been trying to get to this conference for about four, three years, the last three years, and this is the first time I've been able to make it. So I'm exceedingly pleased to be here, and I want to uh, thank uh, Will for putting the privacy discussion right up at the front. Everyone talks about how important it is, but, but very rarely does somebody actually prove that they mean that by sticking it in the front and not putting it at the end of the day. So. Uh, much appreciated. The, um, the title of my presentation is Privacy of Digital Health Data. Are we there yet? Uh, and the reason why I titled it in this way is because it's, it's, it's an ongoing issue. It's an ongoing issue. And in some ways, it's probably always going to be an ongoing issue. And, and the good news story is that we have actually, I think, made a lot of progress in resolving uh, privacy concerns. But that doesn't mean that we're done, right? There, the morphing of technology, innovation that brings us uh, improved ways of protecting data, but also uh, challenges to, um, to data access and, and, and the increased collection of data just enhance the challenges. So it will never go away. Um, but I think that we can take some comfort in the fact that we actually have been able to make some progress in resolving this issue and, and continue to have the attitude of, yes, in fact, we can do this. This is not. Privacy is not the ultimate obstacle to building the health data infrastructures that we're trying to build to improve individual and population health. And if you have the will <laughs> and the stamina <laughs> and a whole lot of patience, uh, you can definitely make this happen. So, so why does this issue keep popping up? Well, survey after survey after survey, uh, in fact, shows that the public is actually pretty excited and supportive of their uh, physicians and hospitals and uh, uh, having electronic medical records, sharing them. Patients are very eager um, to be able to share electronic data, to receive electronic data from their providers, to be collecting their own electronic data in many respects and be able to share that uh, when it's appropriate with their physicians. But, but every time you ask them about this, they, you know, a significant majority of them express uh, concerns about the privacy of their medical records. And, and really, this is survey after survey after survey. Um, one out of six patients essentially pr practice what are called privacy protective behaviors due to concerns about privacy. And these are things like, I won't tell my provider all of the things that are going on in my life that are relevant to my health because I'm a little unconcerned about where that, where that information could go or, or, or lying or what used to be a common uh, strategy would be to see multiple providers or to see them way out of your town in order to avoid uh, the possibility of breaches of confidentiality. Well, as we interconnect providers more, that strategy isn't really available to patients anymore. So to the extent that they have privacy concerns that we haven't alleviated, in some respects, we've made them worse. If we haven't done the work to build the protections in uh, so that they trust the system. And, and that's really what privacy is about. It's not an absolute lock it in a box, bury it in the, in the yard approach to data security, because that means you can't get the data. And, 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 and the real aim of privacy should be to enable the protections that build the trust in the types of data flows that we know we need to improve individual and population health. Patients are suffering from the deficiencies in our healthcare system more than anybody. And data is going to help solve those problems. So we have to be mindful of the fact that consumer interests in this space are, are really in two camps that we should try very hard not to see as being in tension with one another. One is, that, one is that the patients want the data to flow. They want their data to be available to their providers to treat them. On the other hand, if they have concerns about the confidentiality of their data that are so strong that it might keep them from actually seeing medical providers, well, we need to do something about that too. So that's really the story about the, the medical professional privacy side of the discussion. At the same time, we're getting increasing amounts of data about how active consumers are being online with respect to health data. 80% of internet users use the internet to search for health information online. Many of them say they're doing this for other people. But nevertheless, they use it to search for, for uh, to put symptoms in and to try to sort of figure out what might be going on in their lives or uh, the lives of someone they love. There are now nearly 500 social networking sites, either dedicated or used by persons for healthcare purposes. Um, and this is up from um, about 35 
four or five years ago. And this, these are estimates from Health 2.0. A small percentage of patients currently use personal health records, but it's a number that's actually doubled since 2008, and we suspect that this could increase significantly uh, after 2014 due to the view, download, and transmit functions available in stage two of meaningful use. It's estimated that about 500 million people will be using mobile health apps by 2015. Most of these tools are not covered by health data privacy rules. And yet consumers are using them like crazy and likely to use them even more in the future, which creates additional privacy concerns for us to think through. So I'm going to, in, in my talk today, I'm going to sort of highlight what I think are four key ongoing privacy challenges that we're going to have to grapple with over the coming years. One is an area that I loosely call education about rights and responsibilities with respect to privacy and security. And this is both for patients, since they're sharing increasingly their health information online without necessarily being aware of the risks or taking the right set of precautions that they ought to be taking with how they share, but also with respect to healthcare providers. It's really critical with respect to implementation of the new high-tech provisions, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and it's also important to what I call bust persistent myths about HIPAA. People sort of ascribing to HIPAA uh, a set of, of protections that in fact don't exist. And then HIPAA becomes the excuse for not sharing data in circumstances when in fact HIPAA allows data sharing to occur. As we're trying to encourage data sharing and we're, and we're investing a significant amount of taxpayer dollars in building infrastructure to enable the collection and sharing of digital health data, it makes no sense not to make a concerted and, and sustained effort to bust these myths. Taking data security seriously is another area that we'll talk about. Protections for health data shared outside of the HIPAA coverage bubble, this consumer-facing space. And then how do we facilitate the learning healthcare system through data reuse? So not just the use of data to treat the patient in front of you, but the reuse of that data to learn more about how to treat patients like that patient um, across populations. So in terms of education about rights and responsibilities, certainly one of the biggest challenges is successful implementation of the high-tech changes to HIPAA. They are already technically in effect. Federal regulators are not going to start enforcing them until September 23rd. That's just around the corner. So there's a significant amount of sort of education and understanding that needs to take place so that we don't add more myths to the pile of HIPAA myths that already exist out there about what you can't do under HIPAA. Some of the most significant changes include uh, accountability of business associates and clarity around who is and who is not a business associate, uh, clarification of what triggers a requirement to notify a patient in the event of a breach. It's no longer a harm standard, but a much more sort of fulsome investigation of what happened in the breach and determination um, of whether there is a probability that something, that someone accessed that data who shouldn't have. Patient right to restrict data sharing with payers. I have heard very recently that this is being called POOP, <laughs> which means pay out of pocket in terms of the acronym. But it's not, I guess, surprising to me that people are calling it poop, in part because people are not sure exactly, uh, systems administrators are not sure exactly how this is going to be handled when a patient requests this. This is the right not to have data shared with a payer if you pay out of pocket for your care in full. Patients' rights to, elect data, to, to get an electronic copy of their data in the form or the format that they request and to be able to have that uh, data directly transmitted to others, the, the Blue Button Plus efforts and, uh, and Meaningful Use Stage 2 are sort of aimed at creating vehicles uh, for this to happen. Changes to the HIPAA rules regarding accounting of disclosures and the proposed rule regarding the access report and giving patients a report of all the individuals who have accessed their record. This has not been finalized yet. And not only has it not been finalized, but the Office for Civil Rights has been saying that they don't think that their next step will be to publish a final rule. They will publish another proposed rule. 
And they are doing some very uh, important, I think, thinking and outreach to stakeholders to gather information about how they can implement what Congress intended in changing the accounting of disclosure provisions in high tax. So um, that's a subject upon which you could probably fill an entire hour of discussion. Uh, so we won't go into that more. But during the question period, if you want to talk about any of these high tech changes, we can do so. But clearly, getting them implemented properly and not, again, adding to the pile of myths. And then we still have the persistent myths from the first time we enacted the rule that we are still trying to get through. Myths like, I can't share data with you, patient, because HIPAA doesn't let me. I can't tell you, family member who's been bringing mom to the doctor every week, I can't tell you about your mother's condition because of HIPAA. I can't send you, doctor, who's treating my patient, information because HIPAA won't let me. Oh, and by the way, I'll get sued under HIPAA if I do any of these things. Wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> All of it false. Now, you might be able to be sued under your state privacy law, but first you have to violate it in order for someone to sue you under it. But HIPAA does not give patients a right to sue you. The only entities that can enforce HIPAA are the Office for Civil Rights and HHS and your state AG. The state AGs, as far as I can tell, except for two of them, have shown utterly no interest in dealing with HIPAA related issues. But the Office for Civil Rights has shown a lot of interest in enforcing the law, which wasn't the case for about the first five years, but now they are extremely interested. And they are enforcing. And this is heightening the concerns that people have about, despite their best intentions, tripping up and violating HIPAA by sharing the patient's data. And, and the reality is, is that if you look at the settlements that have occurred, if you really dig in and read the settlement uh, agreements, the entities that violated HIPAA were seriously deficient. It wasn't just an accidental oops. It was, well, we haven't done a security risk assessment in about five years. Or we haven't done HIPAA training for staff in about five years, right? Like really not paying attention to what HIPAA requires. And so they're being fined. Um, well, they're under uh, possibility of being fined, so they settle, which is happening in most of the, most of the cases. So it's, and it's important to have this enforcement, but at the same time, it's important to understand what triggers enforcement and what doesn't so that we don't continue to sort of face this, the prospect of, you know, HIPAA won't let me do this because what HIPAA does is give you permission to share in a whole lot of circumstances. But very rarely does it say you must share. You must share data with the patient when they ask. You must share data with the government when they come knocking on your door, but you don't actually have to share data with the provider who's treating your patient who's down the street. You can, but you don't have to. In the face of any concerns about liability and misunderstandings about whether the law allows it, you will always be safer not to share. And we need to absolutely change that dynamic. I, I, think, that, I think that HHS is working really hard to try to um, put more guidance out there so that providers un have a better understanding of what their obligations are. But it's not clear to me that it's breaking through. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, what more can be done, but I know that we have to make better efforts to reach people about what HIPAA does and doesn't require. If, if we actually hope to have a learning healthcare system to be able to meaningfully uh, use health data uh, to change our healthcare system. Taking data security seriously, for whatever reason, the healthcare industry holds some of the most sensitive data out there. They're not the nuclear codes, but, by, but, but in the perception of individuals, it's pretty sensitive data. And while they, they uh, profess to take it seriously, audits suggest that, um, at least on the data security side, this is not happening. The Office for Civil Rights recently did some audits of the HIPAA security rule and found that 58 of 59 providers had at least one security finding or observation. Two-thirds of the entities audited had not done a complete and accurate risk assessment. And those of you who know the HIPAA security rule know that there are some things that are required but other things that are addressable, which does not mean optional. <laughs> it means you're supposed to do it unless you find that it's not feasible for you to do so for a whole host of reasons. And resources was one of those reasons. But it's not optional. But people have been treating them 
treating those implementation specifications as if they are optional. Encryption, for example, is not required under HIPAA, but is an addressable implementation uh, specification. And what uh, OCR is finding is that they're, they're auditing entities, and either they are fully implementing addressable implementation specifications, or they're doing nothing. That's not an option. I sometimes think that we, in security, we, you know, we don't teach healthcare professionals in medical school how to do data security, right? We teach them how to treat patients. And yet, we have to vest them with obligations to protect data because they're collecting it. So we're, we're asking folks who are really not trained in how to do data security to do data security. Which means we have, we have you know, uh, in a, it makes the vendors of the technology very important in terms of sort of giving providers usable, easily usable tools to deploy for security purposes. And then we have an enormous responsibility in our hands to properly train people on how to do data security. Most of the breach reports after high tech put the breach notification provisions in effect are due to lost or stolen unencrypted portable media. That would never happen in a bank. So coming to the third concern, the data that's not covered by HIPAA. I wanted to highlight a few sort of really recent developments um, that will probably alarm you, because they sure did me, Ian, and I'm fully aware of the data environment uh, for consumers out there. Not only does CDT do health data privacy work, but we also have a consumer privacy unit that, that it, you know, looks at the way that data is shared uh, on the web, both, both actively in terms of data that is, that is actively collected from consumers and then the passive collection of data that most consumers uh, may not be aware of uh, through the use of things like cookies. So there was recently a Bloomberg uh, news report uh, that reported on some work done by Professor Latanya Sweeney that showed that aggregate health data released or sold by states, such as hospital discharge reports, can fairly easily be re-identified. Now, now this is not an indication of the failure of HIPAA's de-identification standards necessarily. It's that the states, when they're outside of their roles as payers, when you're not talking about the state Medicaid program, they're not covered by HIPAA. So to the extent that in their sort of public health authorities, they're collecting data and releasing it in the form of reports, they're frequently releasing it with sufficient amount of identifiers in it that it's, you know, it's, it's not that hard to put two and two together and re-identify people in those reports. There's a recent report of an organization called the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, which is actually based out of California, it's further downstate, um, that demonstrated deficiencies in 43 mobile health and fitness app data practices. More than 75% of apps that are free, which a lot of them are, but of course there is no such thing as free, and 45% of paid apps used behavioral tracking of individuals who are on the site, often through multiple third-party analytic tools. And of those who are sharing data with analytic services, only 6% of the free apps and 15% of the paid apps use encrypted connections to send this data. So they were sending it completely unsecurely, and in the majority of these apps, the data practices that they were using, especially in terms of sharing this data with third parties, were either not accurately described or not even mentioned, and some of them didn't even have privacy policies, which is against the law in the state of California. Not clear whether it's against federal law. There's a recent uh, research letter in, that was published in the uh, JAMA Internal Medicine Journal that looked at 20 health websites and found that 13 of them tracked users and seven shared the data with outside companies. It's, when this uh, news broke a couple of weeks ago, we got, a couple, we got phone calls from reporters saying, oh my god, can you believe this is happening? I said, have you been living under a rock? <laughs> this has been going on for quite some time. Health data outside of HIPAA is data that's largely entered into that stream by consumers. So some of it is just their own personal sharing of information, but we are a very close to breaking the door down in terms of actual clinical data that we are giving patients greater access to that they will be able to share in whatever form or format that they want. And that's absolutely important to patient engagement, and I'm wholly supportive of it. 
But at the same time, we really are sending people off into the wild, wild west with this data. And ideally, we would have a better solution for this than, than counseling people to just read privacy policies. Because those of you who have ever signed up for something online or signed up for a mobile app know that the privacy policy, number one, is really hard to read. It's really long most of the time. And on a mobile uh, device, you're sort of scrolling through pages if you're even bothering to read it in the first place. Most people just scroll down to the part where you can say that you accept all the terms and conditions so you can get to using the darn app. So then you have no idea what you've agreed to, and the chances are that what you've agreed to is not very well described in that description anyway. It's, it's, I, I often say the privacy policies. I mean, you know, we are very supportive of transparency, but um, it's just hard to get the privacy policy right. It becomes CYA, cover your ASS, uh, for the entity who's offering the app, right? Well, you agreed to this, even though you probably didn't fully understand what you were agreeing to. So are we actually trying to do something about this from a federal policy standpoint? Well, sort of. So for a while, there was uh, consumer privacy legislation that was being considered in Congress that would have covered really any personal data shared online. This is, this is a, a problem for health data, but it, this is not the only personal data that individuals are sharing online. But Congress very rarely can agree on privacy. For those of you who know a whole lot about the history of HIPAA, the rules are in the regs. Congress actually couldn't agree on privacy rules. And so the only thing that's in the legislation in HIPAA, pre high tech that is, was HHS, Congress shall enact privacy legislation within three years, and if they can't do it, HHS will come up with regulations. Well, they couldn't agree. And so as a result, we have a lot of details about how privacy and security are to, pr to be protected, but most of them are in administrative regulations, not in the statute itself. High tech is the, was the first time since the Privacy Act of 1973 that Congress actually agreed on comprehensive privacy measures, and that's because it was buried in um, a bill that was about 1,000 pages that dealt mostly with saving the economy that had to pass in a, in a democratically controlled Congress with a democratic administration, and it sailed right through. There wasn't a lot of time for debate about those provisions, or, and if there had been, I can promise you, they would not have happened. So the White House issued a report on consumer privacy uh, in 2012 that called for sort of a, a establishment of legislation by Congress, but also voluntary codes of, codes of conduct to be done by multi-stakeholder groups. Um, there was also a call for increased international collaboration. For those of you who deal internationally, you know that there, um, the rules on privacy in Europe in particular are much stronger than they are over here, and they're trying to strengthen them even more than they already are today. And we're getting a lot of you know, companies who are global in nature are getting a lot of uh, heat from European regulators um, because our, our own privacy practices and rules are perceived to be less. And so there is a potentially competitive disadvantage uh, for companies operating in the US that seek to do global business. And so the, obviously, the administration is trying to, to do something about that. There was also a report that came out of the Federal Trade Commission, which is actually a really good report, uh, if you have time to read 76 pages. Um, it, is, it really articulates a very clear privacy framework that's based on fair information practices, which is what the Markle Common Framework is based on as well, about how to protect data. And it includes more effective transparency about privacy practices and, and, and how you achieve consent from individuals in the consumer space for uses of their data in a more effective way. Um, they were also very enthusiastic about what then were some very nascent efforts to get industry to agree on standards for, for opting out of being tracked for advertising online so that you could, as a consumer, for example, click on something either on a per website basis or even better with your internet browser to say, I don't want to be tracked for behavioral advertising. And not surprisingly, the advertising industry is not in favor of such a provision. <laughs> Uh, and, and they are battling this out uh, as we speak, and it's not entirely clear to us that we're going to come out with anything that's going to be terribly worthwhile and that will actually be agreed to by industry, but that's an ongoing effort. So all of this is sort of, th there are attempts to try to deal with 
the wild, wild west of the consumer space. But, 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 but it's, those efforts are heavily dependent on companies to realize that it is in their best interests to protect the privacy of consumer data. And that's not always an easy proposition to accept when, in fact, you're making money on this data. So the last thing that I want to talk about, and then I hope we'll have some time for questions, is um, challenges to what is, what's frequently been called secondary health data uses. Although, as we strive to create a learning healthcare system, we don't really want to think of these uses as secondary, right? We, we want to think of them as routine of, of a use of data as using data to treat you. Because ultimately, again, consumers are very interested in getting the best possible care for themselves, for their family members, and, and, and for populations uh, with whom they identify. And, and we have, as a nation, um, an incredible imperative to improve the quality of our health care and, re and it reduce or at least normalize our health care costs. And you, the data is going to be critical to doing all of that, which means the terms under which you can reuse data that's collected in the clinical setting for such, you know, for analytics purposes, for learning purposes, have got to make sense and be supportive of creating a learning healthcare system while also being uh, a set of provisions that people trust. Because after all, it is their health data, which they have confidentiality uh, concerns about. Um, Currently, our research rules uh, under HIPAA, as well as um, a set of rules called the Common Rule, which apply when you're doing research that is federally funded or you're in an institution that receives federally, federal funding for research, rely significantly on patient consent um, for reuses of data for analytic purposes. Unless, of course, the data is not fully identifiable. So it's either something called a limited data set, which has had some identifying categories removed, or it's de-identified data, which means a lot of identifiers have been removed out of it. But sometimes the data without some of these identifiers is less useful for analytic purposes, depending on the set of questions that you're asking. So identifiable data is, is definitely important for learning purposes, and yet that's what we pretty stringently regulate. Understandably, there's greater privacy risk to it. But in some ways, it's not entirely clear that the way that we regulate reuse of data for analytic purposes makes any sense at all, especially given that we're really actually trying to build a learning healthcare system. So if you are using data that qualifies as a research use, you need to get consent of the patient unless you can get that waived by a privacy board or an IRB. Um, but if you're using it for something that falls under healthcare operations, you don't need patient consent. And this, I want to show you something that become, I, I want to explore this a little bit with you because I want you to see this really interesting paradox that we're trying to sort of drill down on and think through from a policy standpoint about how to do this better. Healthcare operations includes conducting quality assessment improvement activities, including outcomes evaluation and the development of clinical guidelines, as long as the obtaining of generalizable knowledge is not the primary purpose of any studies that result from such activities. This category of healthcare operations also includes population-based activities related to improving health or reducing healthcare costs. That's a lot of the kind of analytics that we want and need to do for the learning healthcare system. Common Rule has a similar uh, definition for research, which is basically if you're contributing to generalizable knowledge and there's some sort of systematic investigation going on, then you're in research. So the dividing line is, are you just using it internally? Well, then it's healthcare operations. If you intend to share the results with others so that they can learn from what you just learned, oh, well, then it's research could be the same study, the same data, the same people exposed to the data doing the analytics. And yet what makes the difference in how we regulate it is how you're going to use the results, which themselves don't usually raise a privacy risk. There's no way that makes any sense at all. It's not based at all on the risks to the data itself or to the risks to the individuals whose data is being used 
in that context. We have to rethink that if we want to create a learning healthcare system, I think, because if we could use more data as operations and yet still be able to share the results with others, we could do more and we could do more easily to contribute to a learning healthcare system. So we actually considered this in the Health IT Policy Committee and included it in comments that we made to an advance notice of proposed rulemaking that HHS put out about changes to the common rule. Um, what we said was that use of clinical data to evaluate safety, quality, and efficacy should be treated like operations. It should be routine. We should be doing this more, in fact, than we are today, even if you intend to share the results with others, as long as you as an entity maintain oversight and, and control over decisions about how to use the data. So in other words, what's, what's, what's important about healthcare operations and why we treat it under HIPAA as though no consent is required is that, the, one, the expectation is that these are routine activities that uh, patients should expect happen to their data. And the second thing is that it is done um, in, a, in an environment that the, the provider data holder with data stewardship responsibilities has a degree of control over. So that doesn't need, need to mean physical possession of the data, but the capacity to control ultimately how it gets used. And, and then, of course, you would have an infrastructure for holding entities accountable for how they did, you know, for any type of data activity that they do within their institutions, which we already do through HIPAA. And that the dividing line about when something falls into research really ought to be based on a, an increased risk to the patient of the actual analytic activity. And so whether that's risk from the standpoint of um, the particular intervention being studied is, is risky from a health standpoint, or the way that the data infrastructure is being created for that analytics actually um, creates an enhanced privacy risk. And, and thinking through sort of with a little bit more particularity about what that would, what, what that kind of risk-based framework for regulating analytic uses of data would look like. And we're, we're currently, um, uh, trying to do some thinking about what this might look like, even outside of the Health IT Policy Committee, we submitted these comments to um, HHS as part of, a, of a, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. We do not know, in fact, whether there will even be any changes to the common rule along these lines. Certainly, the latest uh, omnibus um, rule from HIPAA doesn't really make many changes to the research rules along these lines. You know, they, they have created um, circumstances under which you can get more generalized consents for research uses, but it still defines research in exactly the same way. And it's not entirely clear to us that generalized consents for research do anything more than, you know, cover the liability of the institution, which is important to do. Again, you know, we're, we're trying to encourage people to do, be doing more of this, but in terms of creating an environment that individuals actually trust with their data. It's not you know, sort of clear to me that getting them to sign on the dotted line that you can do any and all research uses of their data is necessarily the best way to proceed with that. So in conclusion, again, I think uh, despite the fact that I've sort of focused this presentation on all the things I think we still need to do um, I think we um, can, can take a breath for a moment and, and, and reflect on the fact that we are actually building infrastructure. Data sharing is occurring, notwithstanding the myths, notwithstanding some of these hurdles and concerns that people have because um, we're figuring out how to do this and the fact that we're actually making progress um, is an enormous testament to how far we've come. But we will always continue to have work to do in this space. And I think you know, what we need to focus on are, I think, the four things that I highlighted. Education about rights and responsibilities so that people don't overinterpret HIPAA. Ideally, they get it just right. Um, educating patients about the environment that, that, that they're going to be entering or are already in with respect to sharing their health data and doing better by them from a policy standpoint. Um, this is really a message to regulators and, and, and policymakers 
that, that leaving um, privacy protections just up to the consumer um, is, is not fair, number one, and probably not the best way to build trust in this environment. Um, and then the secondary, the reuses of data for learning purposes. If we're really serious about creating a learning healthcare system, we need for the regulations to match what we're trying to do here. And that's, uh, and then I'll, I'll close with that. And I, well, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to take them. Yes. Yeah, you know, you know, frequently um, what we sometimes see with, um, with security is that it doesn't well match the workflows that have to take place within a medical professional setting. And so people do workarounds, uh, which is essentially, you know, maybe part of what you've just described. You see, you know, people uh, giving their username and password to their nurse so that the nurse can continually log them into the computer so that it doesn't should a time out after 10 minutes and they don't have that delay. So it's, uh, you know, in some respects, it's, you know, there, there, there needs to be a connection between what security professionals know and a better understanding of what that means in terms of practice in an, in an office or an ER or uh, the medical setting where it occurs so that it's, it ideally should be seamless, right? But it's not. And we have a lot of work to do there. Yeah, Walter. Well, so, so, so frequently what I hear um, from statisticians is that the problems in using de-identified data largely come from data that's de-identified using the safe harbor methodology, which requires the stripping out of 18 categories of identifiers, which include dates of service, um, clear geographic identifiers that are sometimes needed uh, in order to, uh, for uh, surveillance purposes, for example. And, but the safe harbor is the get out of jail free card, right? If you strip out those 18 categories, you are de-identified, end of story. And you can use that data however you want. It's not regulated at all once it sort of crosses that threshold. And so ideally folks would use a statistical methodology to de-identify so that you can actually retain much more of the utility of the data, but you use statistical techniques like perturbation and data masking and uh, differential privacy and you know a whole lot of math stuff that I can't say that I fully understand. But the, but the bottom line is that you, you get a data set that a statistician says this raises a very low risk of re-identification given where it's going and what data that person has access to for linking purposes. And then you, you, it's, it's much more useful. Um, for analytic purposes. But the statistical methodology doesn't have that get out of jail free aspect to it. You have to have a statistician that's willing to, to sort of bless your data set. And there's a limited number of those folks who sort of do this on a regular basis that you know that you can rely on. And most people don't use it. Well, and, and honestly, you know, we're, if, in terms of sort of the minimum necessary fair information practice, both provision in HIPAA as well as data minimization fair information practice principles, you should always only use the amount of data that you need in order to answer a specific question, right? And, and the fact that the limited data set and de-identified data have favorable regulatory treatment, you know, really should be encouraging people to go in those directions. I, and I would like people to reuse data in that format, frankly. But I'm reacting to sort of the feedback that I'm getting from the researchers that I, that I am increasingly working with on these issues. And the fact is, is that those tools work well in many circumstances, but they don't work in all of the types of research that they want to do. And they want some clearer regulatory pathways when they need to use identifiable data. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There is that. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna not have a right left bias here, uh, Lara. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think there's one set of conversations going on about this. To be totally honest, there are multiple sets of conversations, and in many ways that's good, because nobody has the 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 one idea that's gonna break this. And in fact, ideally, there are solutions that get tested in smaller venues. Not, the whole, not that we try to move the whole nation all of a sudden to something that's very different, but that we have a vehicle for saying, this region, this state is trying something new. 
and let's see how it works, right? So if you came up with, I, I, I had this um, thought the other day that uh, the Office for Civil Rights should establish a waiver program, right? We will waive the traditional rules if you come up with a fair information practices-based trust-building framework in your community for how you're going to do reuse of data. And you get it approved by us, and we'll study how well it works by you know, surveying your patients and surveying your docs and finding out how well it worked at the end of the day. We had a summer intern at CDT do research on waiver authority over the summer, and we have the memo that says they can do this if they want to but they have to want to. And, and so I would like to encourage, because again, there is actually no one conversation going on about this. IOM has been hosting meetings, the Bipartisan Policy Center hosted a meeting, EHI has a data and analytics meeting the other day, you could be, probably are having conversations about this in the state, that you know, in many sense, I love that. Let's have more of these conversations, not just one conversation, and, and yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, one of the things, we, we recently did a paper where we looked at nine different multi-site research initiatives, most of which were um, received comparative effectiveness grant funding from AHRQ as part of, um, of I think it was either high tech or, or health reform, and sort of what they struggled with. And frankly, it actually was less about implementation of HIPAA and the common rule and in terms of how they would manage IRB approval and, and consents, et cetera. It was more about the sort of desire not to lose control of your data. Because in addition to having privacy responsibilities over data, data is an asset, right? And, and you don't necessarily want it being used in ways that could be harmful to your institutions in terms of sort of somebody looking at patterns of care and highlighting patterns of care in your institutions that, that don't look as good as their patterns of care and they happen to be one of your competitors, that's a huge issue. So the trust issue is actually not just about privacy. It's also about what are you doing with my data? And, and the legal rules about who owns it or not are, 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 are almost um, a red herring, right? It's this, is, this data comes out of my facility. I collected it about my patients. I have responsibility for it, and, it's, and it you know, is in my records. And so there's a, certain, there's a limit to what I will allow others to do with it, and especially a commercial entity that, that essentially wants to reap benefits by, by uh, monetizing the de-identified data. So I, you know, I don't know what to tell you other than you, know, you do have what physical control is almost as good as ownership. <laughs> in the HIPAA world, and you don't have to release that data, right? Uh, although participation in some of these entities and the financial incentives associated with that uh, create some difficult conversations. Um, the only thing that I would suggest is, is surfacing with the entities that are running those incentive programs, that you're sort of being forced into data sharing situations that are not making you comfortable in order for you to do this, because I think the regulators need to hear about that. There's nothing illegal in that arrangement, um, but to the extent that it's sort of forcing people um, to do data sharing in ways that they don't, they're not comfortable with, I think we need to start hearing about the specific instances of, the, of that. Thank you very much. I'll be here all day. <laughs>